Welcome, everybody. This is the U.S. Gray Sports Podcast. I'm Doug Barry, again, with my very amazing friend, Father Richard Heilman, and that great background he's got now in his new little studio that he's podcasting out of. And we've yeah, got back with us again. All those were gifts from people. That is that awesome? This yeah, is yeah. Your, you're sharing the community with yeah, people on camera now. I, love I wanted to get all these wonderful gifts behind me. <laughs> yeah. And we've got with us Father Chad Ripperger again, and we've got a great and, yes, we're serious, urgent announcement, especially with uh, everything going on in the election, and that's what this is all about. But before we break all that down, let's start it off with prayer. And Father Heilman, that is sure. it to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome. Thank you very much, Father. And thank all of you out there who support the U.S. Grace Force podcast. We always like to start off by giving a big shout out and a big thank you to everybody who who supports us, who prays for us, those of you who support us through the Patreon contributions. And if you're interested in helping us financially with a Patreon contribution, you can click the link in the description below. A few dollars every month from a number of people really goes a long way and helps us get these messages out. This is a very, very critical time right now. We're going to get into this right away because we, we've we got Father Chad Ripperger with us again, and it is awesome to have him back. And, and a great announcement. The election, Father, this is... Uh, this is quite a time we're going through in our country. I know we've had in the past conversation about this is the most important election of our lifetime and this and that. And I know there, for different reasons, have been very important elections in the past. But there is something about this one right now in light of so many things happening in the world that just really does kind of send shivers down the spine if we don't uh, respond properly. Uh, but uh, we want to break all that down and talk about this announcement, this new prayer, this new consecration prayer that you've written. But uh, first of all, Thank you for being with us again, Father Chad. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, and this is, uh, again, under these circumstances, and we get to announce this, that you've got this new consecration prayer, which will be in the description below for everybody to go check out. And we are going to um, uh, end the program, end this episode. I know you're going to lead us in this prayer at the end. Um, can you give us your take on what you see with regards to where we are in kind of the lay of the land, with the election being just months away from now? Well, I mean, I think I'm like pretty much everybody else. I think there's a few things that um, I would say, in addition to what most people are actually thinking, that this is possibly the most consequential election that we're going to have. This this election reminds me, I don't know if it was Solzhenitsyn, and I can't remember which one of who it says is that you get to vote co for communism once to get them in, but once you get them in, that's it. You, you have to yeah. it, it's basically you have to fight your way out. So it's not... Yeah. Uh, and so it's not one of those things where um, this is something to be taken lightly, because I think that, um, you know, what's being proposed for the course of our country is actually um, very contrary to not just the history of this country and the identity of this country and its ethos, but just um, it's just so contrary to the common good in every single respect. Um, and you can actually see why the church historically has condemned things like communism and the stuff like that, because a lot of this is the stuff that's uh actually being proposed but i think one of the things too that i've started to notice you know because sometimes especially as an exorcist you know like in session sometimes i'll stand back and say what am i seeing here right i mean you're in the you're in the thick of the battle but sometimes you have to abstract from the battle and sit and look at the overall complexion of what's really kind of going on and so i kind of do the same thing here in relationship to the election and what i've started to kind of notice is you know because I, I in the past I, in fact it was right at F father heilman's um parish where i said that this is a battle over good and evil which is true it's not just a battle of ideas this is a battle of good and evil but what i started to noticing is and it's it's uh it's not just that people are fighting to stay in power which is also true in in certain respects but what i've started to notice is that when you listen to what there, the, that certain sides of the um, battle uh, or the, the political spectrum are fighting for, it, they're fighting to be able to maintain their immorality. Really, right. it's, it's really about it. This is uh, unfortunately the Freemasons convinced everybody that you can't talk about morality in the context of politics, right? And so they got that separated out. But the problem is, is that that's exactly what's being done here. It's right? so it's literally a fight over 
you know, things that the Catholic Church holds are immoral, whether it's abortion or, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, just a variety of different things, um, you know, and, and things of this, just all sorts of things. It's an actual battle over what's uh, over not just what's good and evil, but the evil side is battling. They're fighting to be able to ensconce and maintain the evil of their lives and their activities without anybody else getting in there and being able to block it and to stop it um, in, in the process. So that's just something I kind of just noticed on a, you know, on a 30,000 foot flyby. Yeah. Father, um, thank you so much. You know, you reached out and, and let me know you were, uh, composing this prayer, this, it, the the title is a consecration of the election to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and it's an amazing prayer. And as soon as you told me that, we were texting with each other. I said, "Please, oh, awesome! Let's have you on the podcast so we can uh, try to get it out to as many people as possible." But I don't know about you. I I, I was uh, came across the Tucker Carlson interview, and he was talking even that this is a spiritual battle we're in right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. everybody's recognizing this, the spiritual component of what we're dealing with right now. And, and you can't, you can't avoid it any longer, but just like you, you so eloquently just stated that it's, it's evil trying to entrench this immorality. This is no longer about politics. This is about good and evil. This is about morals and immorality. Um, and so there's a fight, right? There's a fight that, that needs to be done. And God bless you for listening to the Holy Spirit that we're going to call upon, you know, what, the way I always like to frame it is uh, Jesus' mom is the greatest influencer, right? I mean, I, I, I write pretty often about how <laughs> that, that classic scene at Wedding at Cana, they have no more wine. And, well, woman, what does that have to affect me? And say, do whatever he tells you. You know, right. then right. that got the wheels turning, and that was the first miracle. But but the power of the Blessed Mother, and that we're calling upon her, and we're asking our Lord to 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 uh, to consecrate be consecrated to the Blessed Virgin Mary is so powerful. So again, thank you so much. Um, was there a moment in time was was it was it like you've had it or this is just way out of control or, or what what brought you to that moment where you said it's time we got to write we got to uh, get together and pray this consecration prayer for the election to the blessed mother well i think that um it was kind of kind of a slow realization you know it's kind of a series of things the first is you know as i as i mentioned this is a it's a battle over good and evil and it's a battle of um uh it's a battle of people trying to ensconce their immorality and type of that. And as you just pointed out, it's a spiritual battle. And so, uh, you know, and as an exorcist, I, I just kind of noticed this. You're seeing that, that there, this is, um, you know, kind of like the, the diabolic or the demonic is just trying to push these things as far as it possibly can, as quickly as it possibly can. And now that some people feel like they have their advantage, they're pushing this stuff even further. And so I began to realize, you know, we're in this, this is a spiritual battle that our nation's in. The unfortunate part about it is, is that people have been convinced that, you know, when it comes to religion and politics, you have to keep them separated from each other. You can't be intermixing it. But this is exactly what this is. This is actually a battle for um uh, not just the uh, survival of our country, but the religious survival of our country in a certain sense. And so that I kept seeing this, that, that this because this is a spiritual battle, not, not even the bishops are saying much about, okay, we need to be praying for this. It's not good enough that, that we, um, you know, that we just tell people, look, you need to go vote and vote your conscience and all that, which we can talk about here in just a little bit. But instead, they're, 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 the bishops are just, absent you know there's no there doesn't seem to be any leadership and i thought we need to get the people praying you know and god bless them um, i don't necessarily agree with everything that they do but the the sspx one of the things that they would do is when they wanted to accomplish something they would try and do a million rosaries in order to to get something accomplished and they would do it and it would get it would actually get accomplished which actually tells you the power of prayer and so i began to realize we need to start praying for this election right now so that for two reasons one to keep the diabolic at bay so that they don't influence this election and they don't have the impetus and to be able to push it in a certain direction and then the second thing is is to to place this thing under the mantle of our lady because without her protection uh our country's toast i mean we're just simply not going to 
um, elect the proper people, I don't think. I think that there's going to, we're just not going to have the grace in order to elect those people that need to be, um, that need to be, uh, that we, that hopefully would be elected. Yeah, Father, just a few episodes ago, we had you on and you you broke down the 45 goals of communism, which I was amazed at how enlightening that was, uh, the depth of it. Um there are still people I know who maybe have a hard time wrapping their head around the idea that an election like this, as you said just at the at that outset of this episode, is is once you vote them in communism, you spend the rest of your life fighting to get them out. Right. Can you break down a bit more about what you meant by that statement. I mean, it's pretty clear, obviously, in relation though to the forty five goals of communism and where we are in our country. Well, one of the things that you actually see in relationship to communism is is the employment of um, Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals. And one of those things is, is that, you know, there's no holds bar. They ha- they do not hold themse- themselves to any kind of moral standard whatsoever, whether it's telling the truth or being duplicitous or being hypocritical or just out and out lying, etc. And so um, and then once they get into a position of power, um, they tend to, which I mentioned, I think if I remember right in the last podcast, they're very, they're very, um, uh, they, they tend to use sophistry, which is basically always making the lesser argument. Appear the so when you, even when you call them on the carpet for stuff, they always have some excuse or something which gives it, it's an answer, but it's actually doesn't address the question. And so, mm. um, and then when it comes to the actual fighting of it, this is just a historical observation. I mean, if you look at any country where they, where the communists have finally gained ascendancy in that country, you know, it's almost impossible to get them out without you know, a bloody revolution. And it's usually pretty ugly in order to get them out. And so um, I think that this is, I mean, it, other than say someplace like um, Argentina, which managed to urge that, uh, but they, 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 they hadn't, they hadn't gotten to the point where uh, the, the communists had gained complete control. Right. So once, but once they gain enough control, then they, that's when they go after their political opponents. They start suppressing everybody and speech and everything. And so once that happens, then you have to basically fight your way out because they won't allow, um, and this is something that you actually see, they don't allow for free exchange of ideas. And by that, I mean in the sense that they don't allow for people to be able to sit down and present a reasonable argument to persuade other people because communism in the end really doesn't persuade people. And so they have to basically force it on everybody. And the minute you present an intellectual counter argument, then they, the only way that they can address that argument, because they can't win the argument, is by suppressing you. This is one of the reasons why anytime communism comes into a country, historically, the one of the first groups of people they go after are all the intellectuals. They just wipe out the intellectual class. And that's in order to make, remove anybody who would actually help people to think and to actually analyze what's actually happening. So it's, it really does become a battle. And I think that right now we're in a spiritual battle in relationship to this because there's such a there is such a heavy push. I, I mean, this country is nothing like it was when like Father Heilman and I grew up. It's just 180 degrees around from what it was when we grew up. And it's because it's been slouching towards communism for quite some time. So I think it's really just a matter of um, we're going to, and what, like I said, once they get in, I, I often tell people this, um, is that communists are very similar to Muslims. And hopefully nobody kills me who's a Muslim. But even the Muslims would admit that historically, in relationship to the Catholic Church, the only thing that the Muslims and communists really understand is one thing, brute force. You can't soft pedal things with them. You can't try and reason with them because uh, at least in relation to the uh, the Muslim, for them it's a religious thing, so they have to fight for their religion. But in relationship to communists, They've already abandoned reason because they got they have abandoned the natural law of regarding property rights and everything else. And so they've abandoned reason. And so you can't reason with them. And then even if you and you can't coexist with them because they're like the demons are constantly trying to get in and control everything. And so in the end, the only way you can get rid of them is by brute force, unfortunately, because you can't. Either, let me put it this way. There has never been any country that once they've gained power that has kind of just slowly voted its way out of it. It never happens that way. Yeah, Father, you mentioned, you know, when you and I were younger, it was different, and it was. I mean, I grew up, I always say, I grew up a Kennedy Catholic, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we were just in that, and it was it was for the little guy, and it was, it was uh, you know, taking care of the, 
the working man and all that good stuff. And and we we loved it. And and Kennedy, you know, seemed to have a bishop by his side every time uh where he was anywhere. I mean, the church just uh loved and adored him and it but it changed. And 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 I'd like to get your opinion on this. What I feel we keep using the words communism, Marxism, all these things, and it's true. Um the word I'd like to use is tyranny. You know, yeah. it's a, it's a tyranny. And and it seems something happened uh post Kennedy era that that uh that cut us off as spiritual leaders or or attempted to do that at least to stand against a tyranny. And you know, th- I always point to that beautiful magnificat prayer prayer that you know, you and I as priests are required to pray, pray uh, for evening prayer every evening. But, uh, you know, this is the Blessed Mother pray, praying. And the lines in there are this. Uh, he has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. This is the Blessed Mother. Is she political, uh, Father, for for calling <laughs> out the tyranny of her our times? And honestly, I get accused, accused of being political, and I, I frankly, that's what I feel I'm doing is I'm calling out the tyranny of our time, and I'm right. doing whatever God, whatever gifts God has given me. First of all, to shine a light on it and say, no, this is wrong. This goes against the will of God. Uh, he doesn't want us to be oppressed uh, in, in our time. He, he doesn't want us to live in communism, Marxism, uh, or a tyr- any kind of tyranny. And, right. and so we have to stand against it. But what happened, Father? You know, I, I think before the show you were talking that just after Kennedy, um, I think it was President Johnson, uh, enacted something, and, and it kind of just cut the legs out from under us to, to want to speak out at all against this tyranny. Yeah, I think that it's, uh, I mean, I think that, I mean, first, before I get to that, I think that ultimately it's because things collapsed in the church. And so that the the grace is necessary to resist the, the tyranny was evaporated. In other words, it wasn't being won over because the members of the church weren't leading good Catholic lives. And it's during that time where you start to see the collapse within the church. But that all being said, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of people probably don't know this, but um, it was actually J- uh, President Johnson when he got in. I, th- I think it was by executive order, but he, he put in an executive order that um, uh, that 501c3s could not make political statements. And this was really a, something to get after the church specifically, because he didn't want religions and, and the church to be able to make political statements. There has There's a, been several works that have been written that to actually discuss that it was during the early 60s and into the latter part of the 60s, but it's in the early 60s, and actually in the latter part of the 50s, but especially in the early 60s, really early 60s, like 60, 61, 62, especially when Kennedy got in. The, a lot of the um, Freemasons slash communists, uh, not communists, sorry, Freemasons slash um, certain kinds of Protestants, not the evangelicals and things like that, but certain Protestants became alarmed at the fact that the Catholic Church was gaining such ascendancy because we tended to vote as a block. Like you said, most pe- most Catholics voted for Kennedy or voted de- Democrat or what have you, but they voted as a block and it was becoming a very powerful block, so much so that politically it was going to eventually, at the rate it was growing because we were having children and things of that sort, it was going to basically end up taking over um, the, uh, you know, the political scene. And so... Um, but one of the things that he did is he passed this executive or he signed this executive order that 501c3s cannot make political statements. And that basically meant that um, that the Catholic Church, uh, being among them, could not make political statements, you know, like who to vote for and things of that sort. And what happened was, is right after that came out, I think it was within a year or two, uh, he got sued. The, the government got sued badly because it was a violation of the First Amendment which basically says freedom of religion and freedom of expression. And so they, uh, so what happened was, and they lost. And so what happens is the IRS quietly started what's called the 508, 
And what a 508 is, it's the exact same thing as a 501c3, except it can make political statements. And so it has all the privileges of a 501c3, but you're able to make political statements. And they had to do that because otherwise it was a violation of the Constitution. Now, some of the Protestants have actually made uh, our, our Protestant um Religions are slowly and churches are ma slowly making their change over to 501 because it's a bit of a process to make mm -hmm. to make that change. Um, but none of the Catholic bishops seem to show any interest in it whatsoever, because most Catholic bishops don't want to make they don't want to make political statements. And as I mentioned before, I can somewhat understand it in the sense that um, the priests, you don't want most priests <laughs> making political statements because a lot of them are just, it's just going to be daft. On the other hand, the bishops can just kind of clamp down on it. But what that did is that hamstrung the church to not just make political statements, <clears throat> but it hamstrung the church in the sense that now when it came to political matters that were in point, in fact, <clears throat> like the enactment of certain laws or stuff that was coming up on referendum and things of this sort. Instead, um, now the church is kind of hamstrung uh, psychologically saying, well, we can't really make statements when the bishop should be coming out and saying, I don't want you to vote for X because, you know, Proposition 4 or whatever the case, which is coming up in Florida, is bad or what have you. So they, 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 they're, they've been hamstrung in that regard. And what that did is that kind of, in the end, seeded the political sphere to the diabolic or to to basically to evil man where the catholic church now is no longer um making known not in the sense that it's not the, the politics isn't its domain but morality is and, the, and a lot of this stuff touches upon morality and the catholic church needs to be uh, making its uh making its um its teachings known regarding morality in these areas uh, Father, speaking of morality, can we uh, kind of get into the subject of uh, pro-life and those who, I should say those, there are statements that have been made by some, you know, very prominent even from what I've heard. I'm not going to say I've verified necessarily taking the time to look in to see if they're 100% accurate. So I'm not going to mention any names. We try not to do that on this uh, on this program anyway. But there are some allegedly pro-life very prominent pro-life leaders and influencers who are saying that they will not vote for the Republican ticket because he's not pro-life enough. And so there are some who are saying they're just going to abstain from voting at all. What are your thoughts regarding what direction we go and how we look at the moral factor when it comes to the pro-life issue? Um, I think it was either in Very Tough to Spend or Don and Vita. I can't remember which one it was, but John Paul II talks about the um, what's called the principle of the lesser evil. So I've heard those same kinds of things where people saying that, you know, I'm not going to vote for them because they're they're now pro abort or what have you. And um, which I can see, yeah, it is a problem. And we have to start we have to work on that and fight that as well. But um, the principle of the lesser evil. So let me just kind of parse out that principle just a little bit. It was something which St. Thomas actually talked about. Ironically, he was talking about it in the context of prostitution. So he said, if there's a guy who's a mayor of a city and a bunch of brigands come into the city and they basically seize the city and in the negotiations with the mayor, they'll say, we will cease and desist, you know, causing all the damage and killing the people and this and that. If you can, if you continue to allow us to have prostitution. So then St. Thomas says, can you actually do that? And he said, yes, you can, because it's the lesser of two evils. Right. And so he kind of parses out the principle of the relationship to the lesser of two evils. So in addition to um, that, basically you have a situation where there is um, two evil situations. So in the case of voting, you would have realistically two candidates that one is worse than the other, right? And so that's general. And so the, not, none of them are going to be perfect. And so the question becomes, can I vote for the lesser of the two of the two evils in relationship to the candidates? So then John Paul II, of course, reiterates one of the principles that. Yeah, you can, because he was talking about, can a politician actually vote for a piece of legislation that would mitigate abortion um, in most cases, but allow it in others in order to reduce the number of abortions that are actually occurring? And he says, given the principle of the lesser of two evils, he may do so um, uh, under, there's two parts to this that, that people have to have in place. The first is he has to have a character, a moral character that is um, above question regarding the issue of abortion. So he, it has to be clear to everybody, this guy's pro-life. And the only reason he's really voting for this is because he's trying to mitigate the amount of abortion. So there has to be that particular thing. So the guy's character has to be up and there has to be avoiding a scandal in that regard. 
The second one is when St. Thomas says, and he says, in relationship to the evil, because this is where people don't get it right. They say, but you're still voting for evil. Actually, no, you're not morally. St. Thomas talks about what's called, it's it's a, it's a it's something in his moral writings. He It's all throughout his stuff. He talks about it in a variety of different places, but he talks about it here, and it's called Praetor Intentionum. And it means something that's aside from your intention. So in this particular case, if you're actually looking at the object of the moral act, that's morally what you're doing. What you're doing is you're not voting evil for evil. Technically speaking, what you're doing is you're voting to preserve the good that would otherwise be lost if if you didn't vote or if or mm-hmm. if you voted for the person that was more evil. So you're actually voting to either basically your vote or um, what you're doing is actually a, it's a re, it's mitigating the amount of damage or evil that would uh, otherwise occur. And so in that you're actually voting to preserve the good that would otherwise be lost. Right. And that the evil that is the um, of that of the of the law or of the in relationship to the um, uh, to the particular candidate is praetor intention. It's aside from your intention. So as long as you're not voting for him because he's evil or because you're voting for his evil things, but you're precisely voting, your intention is to preserve the good, then what happens is, is that morally speaking, that's what you're doing. Okay. So then in some of the moral manuals, the question is that it gives you permission. You may vote for this. Now, the question then becomes, and this is where some of the debate sets in, but, I, but I'll give you my opinion on it. They say, well, um, some say you may vote for it, but you're not obligated to vote in that particular situation. And um, I would say, I think that largely depends on the circumstances. If you're in a situation where, for example, in the case of, let's say, a, a, a piece of legislation is coming up that would mitigate abortion, and you already know that 75 out of 100 of the those who are voting are already said, no, we're going to vote in this piece of legislation so that it mitigates evil, and you already know that that's going to happen. Okay, well, then you may not necessarily have to vote in a circumstance like that. However... The church has over and over and over again said that we have an obligation to vote as part of our civic civic duty, specifically in relationship to what's called legal justice, the obligations that we have as individuals to the state and that we and for the for the sake of the common good. And we have an obligation as citizens to do our part to um, preserve the good to the degree that we can um, within our confines. And this is a duty. This is not just a you can. It's a it's an obligation and a duty. So I would argue, given the fact that the church has reiterated over and over again that those people who live in democracies and have the uh, the right to vote have actually also an obligation to vote for the sake of the common good. And I would think, it seems to me, that you would be obligated to actually vote the lesser of two evils in, in the upcoming election in order to preserve the good that would otherwise be lost. Mm-hmm. That's just my own take on it. I know other people have different positions, but it seems to me that if we don't vote and to the degree that is, uh, and, and to, in order to mitigate the evil, then uh, it seems to me we're partially responsible for it. It seems to me. I wholeheartedly agree with that, Father. I, yeah. And so please, everyone, vote, vote, vote. And please, please pray with us, too. You know, one of the things I've noticed, Father, and I think especially it's, I think I've always known it, but I think I've especially become acutely aware of it in the last five years. You know, what a crazy, crazy five years. I call it five years. It's basically the end of 2019, but to, to the present. But, what you know, that our streets were boarded up and on fire and there were riots and, and everybody was uh, locked in their houses and we were locked out of our churches and, and the censorship of our First Amendment rights and anybody who spoke up was just castigated and, and, uh, you know, belittled uh, and, and and censored and canceled and all the all that stuff. If they dare, I mean, holy cow! You know what's yeah. going on, it, especially in the last five years. Which again, and I'd love to get your take on this too. But but uh, I, it seems like Satan gets uh, what I like to call he gets um, full of himself, uh, and 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 so he actually reaches too far to his demise. Because what happens is that more and more people begin to understand. But here's the phenomenon I'd love you to to talk about, Father. And I'm actually, because of my uh, background, I've I've, uh, poured myself into spiritual formation throughout my priesthood. 
and you know my football background and all this stuff. I'm actually starting a series on this. Uh, I'm going to launch uh, the, the announcement is co- coming out what will be tomorrow morning, the first day of the football season, by the way. And then, uh, and then every Saturday, I'll be putting out these motivational talks on spiritual strength training. Because here's the, here's what I'd like you to comment on, Father, is that the phenomena I witnessed, especially over the fa- past five years, is that there were a few that knew what the devil was doing, and they they were like. These evil monsters, you're not going to pull the wool over my eyes. You're, and, and, they, and they tried to warn other people what they were doing, you know, that what they were up to with inciting riots and, and all this stuff. Uh, it just seemed, Father, that the spiritually strong, and we know too that, that some of the government agencies, they call it traditional Catholics. I think it's just strong Catholics are dangerous. Why? Because... Mm. They see as God sees. Why? Because they have the Holy Spirit in their heart. You know, I don't know. That was the phenomena I saw over the last five years, Father. And and what about this need for us to become better well-connected to the divine life, spiritually strong in our time? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I think that uh, these series that you're going to do is going to be important for people for this reason in the sense that people need to know you know, it's not just enough to tell people, "Hey, be strong." You actually have to tell them, "Okay, this is how you, this is how you have to be strong, and these are the things you need to do to build right. the discipline, to build this." And I think that um, it's it's precisely uh, the way I I would uh, phrase it is um, it's it's the same as yours. It's just looking at it from a slightly different point of view. So you said you don't have the Holy Spirit in the heart. I think that's absolutely true. To rephrase that in a in a, in a slightly different theological way, which actually it does encompass the same thing, is these are the same people that have are leading lives of habitual grace. They have the sanctifying grace in their soul, yep. the indwelling of the blessed Trinity, the Holy Spirit in their soul, and so these are people that are leading a habitual lives of grace. And so they were given the actual grace, I think, to see because God I always tell everybody God's a is a is a He's he's a very assiduous banker. When he invests in something, he tends to <laughs> protect it, right? So, and this is something when he gives us the sanctifying grace, he's going to continue giving us the actual grace is necessary to preserve that. And I think that's what you are seeing yep. is that people who are leading the lives of grace, as a general rule, were able to see how evil it actually was. And I think some of it is also too. These are also the people that take their faith very seriously, their formation in their faith very seriously, and they take um, and they adhere to the, what the church has always taught. Um, in in these matters. And so because they knew that and they were leading lives of grace, they were able to pick this stuff out very quickly. Father, you mentioned that um, a lot of the bishops are kind of remaining silent, priests in general. Do you, do you get a sense that there is any kind of um, effort uh, with uh, the, the clergy, the spiritual head of the church, the spiritual leaders of the church to try to bring this to, are, are we seeing any more? trying to bring this to the surface so people can be taking this more seriously, understanding really what is at stake. Because I really think what you said at the very beginning of this program, we need to remember, you you vote them in once when it comes to the communist mindset, and then that's it. Now you've got to deal with that, and it can become pretty vicious and brutal. Are you seeing more spiritual leaders like yourself, Father Howman, speaking out more about how serious this is and how we need to get into this spiritual battle more intensely, or do you think this is just kind of, uh, you know, standard par for the course with any other election? Uh, Father Hollyman, you want to answer first? Oh, no, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. I, I, to be honest with you, other than, say, someone like Father Heilman and myself and a few, and just a few, sm- just a handful, um, a, a lot of priests do kind of see what the problem is and they kind of see what's going on, but the, the timidity and the... Um, the, uh, among the clergy is pretty strong. Now, some of that is understandable in the sense that if they say anything, their bishop just slaps them down. But the uh, but as a, but um, I I have not seen, and especially among the bishops, you don't see um, any of them saying, "Hey, we got to pray our way out of this situation." The only way we're going to get out of this situation, because as we said, it's a spiritual battle, is by praying our situ- prayer on our way out and being disciplined. And as uh, <clears throat> Father Heilman is going to show in his upcoming series. Is gaining that spiritual strength in order to fight the battle. I, I just don't. I just don't. I'm not seeing it personally. Hmm. Yeah, I, I wonder. I, what my hope is, I tend to be the hopeful person, um, but my hope is that uh, 
the stranglehold that the devil has on us is loosening that that it's um that it, there's a breaking down again in his arrogance he overplays his hand and hopefully among the spiritual leaders I, i'll say because uh it's it's all spiritual leaders but among the spiritual leaders I, I, hopefully they are aghast enough by now hopefully to say wait a minute okay we do have to speak up it's time because evil is just i, I like to say he's just coming in and he's dancing he's just, he's just oh this is just too easy uh and it has been for him and that that's been the shocking thing and again i think especially in the last five years it's just been so easy and like you say anybody dares speak up you know about a tyranny um I, I got castigated because of unjust imprisonment i mean it just if you dare speak up and then what happens too is that some people are given as an example to others if you dare speak up you're gonna get what that person got and so there's the, like you say there's the timidity i, I like to call it fear uh yeah. that it, we were just not allowed to speak up but there's got to come a time and i'm this is the hopeful part about it is there's got to come a time where okay okay this is enough uh maybe they'll say i get it now you know i don't know uh but there hopefully there's going to come a time that it's just so bad uh well, that I, that they have to finally say something yeah if you don't mind me stepping in i'm sorry real quick father yeah. Riverger, do you, do either of you have any advice for us lay people? Because I know there got to be lay people out there right now thinking, what do we do to try to get our priest to come out of that timidity or that fear that you both mentioned? Yeah. Um, well, in addition to praying for him and asking Our Lady to give him the grace in order so that he'll have a certain kind of fortitude, I, um, I guess this is where I differ from Father Heilman. I don't have that much hope in the clergy. <laughs> uh, I have all sorts of hope in our Lord and our Lady, but I don't have much hope in the clergy. Um, and part of it is, is just because they're, I, let me put you this way. What we saw, how they just rolled over both bishops and priests during, it made me realize, oh. wow, we yeah. have, we, we, we just don't have, we don't have soldiers in Christ anymore. I know. Is what we're dealing with. So, um, but, it, it, you know, as far as what you can do, as I think is, um, as layman, I think the main thing is do is prayer and good fast. And then even maybe mention it if your priest is, if he's the right kind of a priest and he's open to it and say, you know, Father, maybe you need to get up there and say something about, you know, how we have to actually fire for this thing. You know, and as Father, as you were actually talking, I think that one of the reasons why I think the selection is of such consequence is because um, you know, in addition to if we don't, uh, if if we if they get in now, then it's going to be a fight on our way out. I think we're at we're at the last stages where there is any semblance of being able to speak the truth freely. Right. There is, and it's the we're at the last stages where you can actually mount a counterattack and maybe be successful. Yeah. If what happens is is if the communists get into the government pretty much in full force it's going to be pretty much over because um there it's not just going to be lawfare on every single level against their opponents it's going to be they're going to start just shutting everything down yep. and so um but that's just my take on it i could be wrong i mean there's so much evidence and this has been going on for so long and we've heard from so many different sources that have talked about this um another program we had on the week after you michael de rosa who was talking about pretty much the same thing the subversion techniques and tactics that have been going on for the better part of a hundred years just yeah. implementing bella dodd and some of those those cases father uh Riviger, what's your take on for example the bella dodd incident and what took place and 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 you know michael de rosso made the point that if it hadn't been for you know god's grace working through even fulton sheen who had such a connection with bella dodd we may not even know the gravity of how um, so many communists were infiltrated into the church, even through the seminaries. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the Bella Dodd incident and what happened there? Yeah, I mean, basically what happened, okay, so just for those who don't know, there is, um, you can, they can actually read the book called The School of Darkness, where she kind of chronicles her beginnings, stages of becoming a communist and being in the Communist Party and all the stuff she, she did towards the end. And it's actually very factually laid out. It's not, you know, we're just generally talking. 
Uh, and then at a certain point, she became, um, she was converted by Fulton Sheen. She started switching. And then Fulton Sheen actually converted her. And then he actually convinced her to go to Congress and actually give congressional testimony about the infiltration of the communists in pretty much all levels of government um, and even into the Catholic Church. She said that she herself um, managed to get over a thousand communists into the seminaries in this country alone. And I think that's one of the reasons why you tended to see such a shift in the 60s and 70s um, towards that kind of mindset. Um, but but it wasn't just here. It was it was all around. In fact, I don't know if you saw there was actually a um, a uh, um, I think it was a revelation by one of the it was something that came out of Russia, but it was about two or three years ago where they openly admitted that um, Russia was the one who came up with liberation theology and promoted it in South America. Mm. They were the ones who promoted it and got it going. Mm. <clears throat> and so that even had had that. So Bella Dodd, um, the and then, of course, she also knew which people in the magisterium in the hierarchy were actually part of this group. And she was going to name names, and then Fulton Sheen um, convinced her not to name the names, be only be in order to avoid scandal. Now, my hope is, which I think that you know, I, I can understand the thinking at the time because under normal circumstances, you don't air out your dirty laundry; you just deal with it, right? Well, the church mm -hmm. didn't deal with it, of course, but you just deal with it. But now, I think, dude, looking back at it, it probably would have been very bad for the church initially, but at least maybe it would have been addressed at least at that time if she would have named names. My hope was is that she actually would have sent the names to the Vatican, but from the way Bella Dodd talks, that some of the cardinals even in the Vatican were already compromised by this whole thing. So um, that that was actually the Bella Dodd was um, was actually the revelation that God I think gave her the grace so that we would be knowledgeable that this type of stuff actually ended up happening. My hope is at some point she wrote the lay, the less down and it's somewhere. Hmm. Wow. One thing I worry about, Father, you know, I talked earlier about those who are well-connected can kind of see what's going on. The downside of that is that, you know, they might be prone to despair because it's just so bad right now. And yeah. and I think the reason why it's able to advance unabated is because we are weak. We need to get strong. But like I right. say, those who are close to the Lord are seeing this and they're, and, and they're you know, they're looking around. And I know you are too, the, why isn't anybody doing anything about this? And what can we right. do about this? And and I think your uh, your inspiration to uh, to make this prayer to to construct this prayer con consecration of the election to the Blessed Virgin Mary is actually the first move we need to do if we're if we're That's going right. to there's a battle for the soul of America. I mean, oh my gosh, when the communists took over that line. You know, uh, wow, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, but it is a battle for the soul of America. And, uh, Father, why the Blessed Mother in this time? Why is it so important for us to to call out to to Mary and consecrate um, the election to the Blessed Mother? I think there's three reasons. The first is, is obviously she's the one that conquers Satan. I mean, she crushes his head, and so right. this is a spiritual battle. We need her help um the second component to it is that um, we also need the grace because she's the mediatrix of all grace we need the grace for the people in order to make the right choices in the election and also that she gives the grace to those people that would you know help to make sure that there's integrity in the election and all those things regardless of whether you think what did you think about the 2020 election? It does, it's not really germane. There's been so much talk, even in the mainstream news media, about, and even the Democrats have been talking about, there's concern about the integrity of this election, et cetera. So I think that that's uh, one of the things, but it's it's to pray to her for her to that. But then the other thing is, too, is, is to give us a framework to understand that we're not going to get out of this on our own. She's got to be the one that's going to basically rescue us in this situation. And she is the patroness of the United States um, under the title of Immaculate Conception, which the bishops, I think it was 1865, don't quote me on that exactly, is when they made her the patroness of the United States uh, under that title, the Immaculate Conception. And so I think we need to um, invoke her in order to get, um, to get her involved because... <clears throat> 
basically all she has to do is just tell her lord this is what i want and he's going to give it to her <laughs> so we yeah. have to you have to get her uh to to convince her to pray to her and to um gain favor from her that she'd be willing to do so yeah Father Rivera, I'd like your, if you don't mind your comment on the very fact that, you know, everything you just said about Our Lady, go back to 1917, Fatima. Um, you know, I, I just think that a lot of people don't realize, number one, that World War II was a chastisement that was prophesied by Our Lady. She said it would happen if we didn't right. stop offending God. Uh, it wasn't just a geopolitical problem. It wasn't just, you know, Hitler was upset, you know, that World War I went so badly and he decided to and so forth that there was something that this was allowed by God as chastisement. She said it would happen if we didn't repent. Then she goes to the level of saying that Russia is going to spread the error for ways. And of course, that's what we're talking about, dealing with the whole, you right. know, Marxist, now communist, and so forth. But in that message of Fatima, in those six apparitions, she repeats, I believe it's the only thing she repeated in each apparition, if I'm not mistaken, is when you pray the rosary, you can avert war and bring peace to the world. It just seems right. to me, and I just love your, your comment, because I think it's one of the simplest things that we can all do, whether the election is fair, whether any election is fair, we still need to do our part there, yes. But if I just remember to, to daily knock that rosary out, make sure that I'm yeah. doing what she asked me to do, how important is it that Catholics understand that sense of discipline, all of us, that we don't lose hope and realize this is the peace plan that was given from heaven through Our Lady in regards to a chastisement of a Second World War and Russia spreading their ever ways. It seems as if prayer, fasting, sacrifice, especially the rosary, is pretty incredibly key to all of this. And for those Catholics or any of us out there who might be struggling with confidence in the rosary or confidence in this kind of devotion to Mary, what would you say? Um. Well, precisely what you said. Ultimately, what happened is, by divine ordinance, God set up Our Lady specifically, and she came and appeared saying, this is what is to be done. God set her up as the antidote to the very problem that we're actually having. You know, I've mentioned that, I think I mentioned this even in, in with, with you guys, but one of the things that always kind of shocked me was to think of the fact that um, Our Lady said that the Pope and the bishops are to consecrate the prayer to, uh, you know, Russia to the Immaculate Heart. All it would have taken is that one five-minute prayer. That's it. That's all she wanted. Mm -hmm. Think of yeah. the level of merit that one prayer would have had that we would have averted everything we're going through right now. Right. And so that wow. that's she yeah, but the point being is, is that God set her up as the antidote to this particular thing. Padre Pio and the numerous saints have said referred to the rosary as the weapon in the spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle. And so saying the rosary every single day is a key thing. It's not only the, the some of the saints even refer to it as a sign of predestination um, to heaven, but it's but it's one of those things that we should be saying it every single day, if for no other reason than to to be warriors in the battle that we're dealing with right now. Yeah, we're doing right now, we're we're in the um uh Novena for our nation, and we're praying that rosary every day. I think we're up to somewhere between eighty and 100,000 people that are praying together that rosary. And people, you can go to usgraceforce.com, and you can find how to become a part of that. I can I can email you the prayers every morning, or you can just go to the website and get them. But uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful prayer, the 54-day rosary novena. Father, I've, uh, I've, I've found a lot of... Um, well, miracles, but uh, but a, a, a real power in in that prayer. But it's 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 not just that. It's the rosary. It's right. uniting, right? I mean, we need need to unite. Yeah. And one of the things I'm going to do, Father, too, is I'm going to add this consecration of the election of to the Blessed Virgin Mary as part of our daily prayer routine that goes up. It goes between August 15th and goes up to. The um, the feast of uh, Our Lady of the Rosary on October seventh, where we'll be together. Uh, Doug and I are going to be able to be there. I know you you had something going on, but uh, we're going to be there out in Washington D.C. and processing our Lord through the streets of Washington D.C. I think we go right past the Supreme Court, and uh, and we'll be out there praying praying for our country, praying for our land. But again, it's the Blessed Mother. It's the power of the Rosary. I've seen it so many times. You know, I have a, a 501c3 called Combat Rosary for Heroes, 
And I wanted to get rosaries in the hand of the military and law enforcement and and and, and all those who keep us safe. And uh, I've seen so many stories. And again, I, I just want to say this just to emphasize the power of the rosary, but people who just like touch the rosary, the stories where they receive it, the rosary from a chaplain, and they go, you know, I think I should get back in my faith. And in that moment, it's like grace comes upon them. And uh, and there's a desire to get right with the Lord, to get well connected again with the Lord. So, so Father, thank you so much for, for leading us through Our Lady to the Lord uh, during this incredible time. Uh, do you do you see hope uh, going forward to, you know, answer? Well, I mean, and- yeah, I mean, if we pray hard enough, she might, um, she might give us more leaders that will help us to yeah. at least combat this. It, I mean, it, even if we get the right people in all of the positions, it's going to be a long slog because these, the communists are all throughout the various levels of our government. I mean, that's one of, I mentioned Skozen in the last time we were talking and his, his work, so he talks about how they got into all these different areas in the government and how how they had influenced uh, policy and decision making and things of that sort. But you know, if I was to probably just boil it down to one thing, based on what Doug, the question that Doug had asked, which is, if our Lord set Our Lady up as the antidote to communism, if we're in a battle for the soul of our country, which is basically a battle in relationship to whether communism is get, our country is going to become communist or not, well, then she's the antidote. So we have to return to her ultimately. Yep. And Father, this I know we're going to be wrapping up the episode here in just a moment with the consecration prayer. You're gonna you're gonna lead us in it. Um, is this uh, your your thought behind? Is is this that we intention to pray this every day so that the audience understands what is it you mean by this? Yeah. So basically, the idea is um, once we consecrate it and give it to her, give it to Our Lady, and we keep if we do it consistently. So this is a practice that I just do even as an exorcist because I, I you know, just keep all the to keep the demons at bay in the various areas of my life. I consecrate those various areas to Our Lady, and uh, by and large, it it works. You know, and I don't have to. I I, I always tell Our Lady, watch my flag, so I don't have to deal with this stuff. And hmm. so this consecration. Um, I think the idea behind consecrated, because in the past I said, you know, why don't we say this prayer? But the consecration was specifically to hand this over to Our Lady because she's the one that's going to be able to accomplish it. So when I wrote the prayer, um, I based it on three separate prayers. So the first, the very first part of the prayer actually comes from one of the prayers in the Recalta. And then um, the second part is... Um, Parts that actually come from the consecration of exterior goods, which I have them think. And then the latter part is actually from parts from a prayer of Our Lady Endure of Knots, because we're, we're kind of in that kind of a situation. Yeah. Um, the last line actually comes from one of those uh, prayers for that. So that was kind of the idea is to uh, invoke her um, specifically under said. So uh, as I mentioned, she's the patroness of the United States, and she's also the uh, under the title of Immaculate Conception. But I also make reference to her being wisdom, the, that wisdom that is Christ is the wisdom that lies hidden within her. And that's what we need right now. Our country is so foolish mm. in all its decisions and all the things it's doing. They're, they're not being governed by any sense of wisdom. We have to be willing to discern that. And also the fact that, um, you know, as queen of heaven and earth, as St. Louis Marie de Vaupre says, a single sigh from Our Lady is more meritorious than all the martyrdoms, all the prayers of all of the saints combined. And so, which is true, because anything she just even asks for, boom, God gives it to her. So all things are subject to her. And so we need to, uh, even the, our, our country ultimately is subject to her. And so we need to pray for that. And then um, then we make the consecration of the election and its outcome and then um, ask for the grace to be given to the citizens, um, to the country, so that we choose the right leaders. And so, Father, I'm sorry, so go ahead. daily or a one-time prayer then? Do you oh, think? yeah. So I'm, I'm recommending that everybody, you know, they can do this. It's not that long of a prayer, maybe two minutes at the most. And then they can just, I just tell people, let's just say it every single day between now and the time of the election. Okay. Yep. All right. Good. Good. Father, thank you for our, your love of Our Lady, yeah. your love of our Lord, your love of our country, and uh, thank you for your amazing ministry. Uh, I am so glad to have this prayer, and I uh, obviously I'm going to pray it every day, uh, and I'll pray it with with my rosary every day as, as we're doing Novena for Our Nation. But uh, with that said, Father, could you lead us? This is sure. this will be the first time that this, this is prayed publicly, so... 
Yeah, um, and then what we'll do is right at the end of it, I'll just give everybody a blessing. Is that what you'd like to do? Yep. Yes, okay. please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mary Immaculate, living tabernacle of the divinity, where the eternal wisdom lies hidden to be adored and served by angels and men, queen of heaven and earth, beneath whose sway are subject all things that are lower than God, patroness of the United States of America, sorrowful and mindful of our own sinfulness and sins of our nation, we come to thee, our refuge and hope knowing that our country cannot be saved by our own works and mindful of how much our nation has departed from the ways of thy son, we humbly ask that thou wouldst turn thy eyes upon our country to bring about its conversion. We consecrate to thee the integrity of the upcoming election and its outcome, so that what is spiritually and morally best for the citizens of our country may be accomplished, and that all of those who are elected would govern according to the spiritual and moral principles which will bring our nation into conformity with the teachings of thy son. Give grace to the citizens of this land so that they will choose leaders according to the patriot heart of thy son, that his glory may be made manifest, lest we be given the leaders that we deserve. Trusting in the providential care of, of God the Father and thy maternal care, we have perfect confidence that thou wilt take care of us and will not leave us forsaken. O Mary Immaculate, pray for us. Amen. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti Super Vos, et Mani et Semper. Amen. Amen. Thank you, wow. Father. Thank you very much, Father.